Hello and welcome to another in my series of talks about women behind the scenes of history. This one is about the history of an amazing movement in this country and abroad, the Women's Institute. It's based on my book, A Force to be Reckoned With. As usual, I'm very happy to answer questions afterwards. Just send me an email and there will be cocktails and canapes after the talk, um, if you've got any handy. Sit back and enjoy learning about an extraordinary group of women. I'd like to begin with an extract from the book, if I may, describing an incident in the recent history of the Women's Institute with which I should think you're pretty familiar, whether or not you were there on the day. The traffic around Wembley Arena Conference Centre on the 7th of June 2000 was crazy. The streets of North London wheezed with coaches from all over the country, each one packed with well-dressed women fanning themselves in the heat. There were 10,000 in all, a horde of biblical proportions. Those of them who'd been to the annual general meeting of the Women's Institute before were used to a certain amount of chaos, but things were different this year. There was even more traffic than usual, more policemen, Lots of unfeasibly broad-shouldered, twitchy-looking young men in suits scanning the crowds, and an extra buzz rippling along the queues of delegates waiting to be admitted to the building. Cameramen wandered around looking for good vantage points, and an irrepressible air of excitement was shimmering above the crowd like a heat haze. Someone really big, it was rumoured, was to be this year's guest speaker. It soon became apparent who this was. Prime Minister Tony Blair, who had invited himself, slightly inconveniently as it turned out, to come and address the Women's Institute. The WI always makes clear to its speakers that theirs is not a party political organisation. It wasn't when it was first established and it isn't now. Its ideal members have a duty to themselves to be politically aware and committed to public affairs, but both individually and collectively, political affiliation is not relevant. Party politics are too divisive, too distracting, and in the early days were thought too taxing. Anyone expecting to address the WI at any level, including the Prime Minister, is explicitly warned to avoid party politics altogether. Chairman Helen Carey and the WI's Board of Trustees agreed to Tony Blair's request to speak on the clear understanding that he would do so in his capacity as the elected leader of the country's government, not as a party leader. Fine, said Downing Street, you're worrying too much, there'll be no problem. Mr Blair had just returned from paternity leave after the birth of his son Leo. This would be his first public speech. Helen Carey explained to his office the ecological theme of the AGM and assumed he'd be pleased to be associated with what was then a very progressive topic. Ask him to speak on the sort of world he would like for baby Leo, she suggested, and let us know how we, as members of the WI, can help sustain that world. And do remember, she added, we are intelligent women. There will be 10,000 committed members from constituencies all over the country. Don't patronise us. And please, please don't be late. Mr Blair had requested an autocue for his speech, which the WI declined to provide on the grounds of expense. Perhaps that's why he looked so nervous, thought Helen Carey, as she welcomed him onto the stage. He was 20 minutes late which had made the audience fidget and whisper and irritated to the Board of Trustees. Having been told proudly by Tessa Jarl that Mr Blair's speech was really good and that he'd written it all by himself, Mrs Carey introduced him with a hopeful reminder of the sort of topic he was supposed to be addressing and an encouraging smile. Once he had delivered the obligatory jokes about being terrified of masked women and had expressed the hope that he was suitably dressed, ho-ho, in the light of the calendar girls, then the Prime Minister launched into his speech. After ten minutes, it was clear something was awry. The audience was muttering. The board members were staring at their hands. And Mr Blair himself was beginning, as Mrs Carey whispered to her neighbour on the platform, to lose the plot. He hadn't mentioned the green agenda at all. He spoke instead about labour initiatives, interest rates, 
National Health Service reform, all very well in their place, but this was not it. Lacking his autocue, he kept turning away from the microphone so that at times the WI's noise levels were louder than his voice. As he continued relentlessly with what was amounting to a surreal sort of party political broadcast, women began to leave, while others started that slow hand clap. The atmosphere by now was a febrile mixture of embarrassment, anxiety and anger. And still Mr Blair kept going, his voice rising imperceptibly in pitch until he was almost squeaking. His face, projected on large screens around the arena, grew wild-eyed and rather panicky. He paused occasionally, unable to ride the noise, and once Mrs Carey interrupted him with a heartfelt plea for courtesy on the part of the WI. But in the end, Mr Blair spoke for over 40 minutes. I'm glad we're having a good debate, he offered, before sinking to his seat like a stone. Mrs Carey rose to thank her guest. We always like to give our speakers something to take away with them, she said with the sweetest of smiles. The relief on Mr Blair's face was palpable. Something for Leo, perhaps, crocheted in an obscure Rutland parish, or a pot of superior jam for Cherie. Mrs Carey continued, So, we've planned a petition signed by thousands of our members against your closing of local post offices. By next morning, the Women's Institute's collective handbagging of the British Prime Minister had become international front page news. History is currently of the opinion that the 2000 WI AGM marked a turning point in the fortunes of Tony Blair's premiership. From then on, the Labour message was met with a measure of disillusionment and mistrust. The spin machine engineered by Alistair Campbell was brought under scrutiny and Mr Blair himself, after such a public display of embarrassment, trod more warily. You might think that his opinion about the WI changed, but if you read his autobiography that was published a few years later, he did still speak about the good matrons of the WI, so I'm not quite sure if he got it. The fortunes of the WI also changed that year. We swapped one image, the wholesome old Jam and Jerusalem one, for another scarcely more fortunate. Now they were all strident handbaggers, even more frightening en masse than Mr Blair in his pre-speech quip had imagined. This bothered the board of trustees, but didn't worry two elderly Yorkshire women overheard in the queue for lunch that day. Bristling, one of them said to the other in the broadest of moorland accents, Who the hell does he think he is? Aye, replied her companion proudly. You don't mess with the WI. As the daughter of a WI secretary from Yorkshire myself, I know that to be true. What I'd like to do for you today is just explain a little bit why you don't mess with the WI. And I'll start right at the beginning. It was a bereaved Canadian mother, aged 40, who first had the modest yet very radical idea of setting up regular meetings for ordinary women to get together with their husband's permission in people's front parlours, kitchens, even the garden shed, to talk about things that mattered and consequently to change the world. Her name was Adelaide Hoodless. Although it's assumed to be the most British of institutions, the WI was formed not in the Tweedy Shires of England, but in the backwoods of Canada. Addie was a farmer's daughter of Irish descent, born in Ontario in 1857. After a basic local education, she married a prominent businessman and moved to the fruit-growing area of Hamilton in 1881. There, four children were born and the youngest, John Harold Hoodless, died. He contracted a common infection known locally as summer complaint through drinking contaminated milk and he perished at the age of 14 months. In those days, 20% of all Canadian children died before their fifth birthdays. Addie was convinced that this was due to the ignorance of their mothers who, like her, knew nothing of the science of hygiene. The Hoodless family's milk was delivered in an open churn, having collected goodness knows not on the way from the dairy to the doorstep. If only Addie and the dairy farmer's wife had known how to handle milk safely, 
John's and hundreds of other infants' lives might have been saved. Education was the key. In December 1896, Adelaide was invited to address a meeting at the Ontario Agricultural College. The secretary of a farmer's institute near Hamilton, Mr Erland Lee, was so impressed by her performance that he booked her for the next ladies' night at his institute to be held in the settlement of Stony Creek. Not everyone at the institute was happy to have a lady speaker, but Lee prevailed. Thirty-five wives were present when Adelaide arrived at Stony Creek on the 12th of February 1897 to speak to the mixed audience on the importance of domestic science education for girls. And not just girls. Given her adult audience, Adelaide pointed out that homecraft was something women of all ages could benefit from studying. She sympathised with the boredom and drudgery of life at home on a farm, where she spent her own childhood, and then made a suggestion. Why not form a sister organisation to the Farmers Institute? A sort of local club where women could meet and learn from speakers and each other. Not about the husbandry of stock and crops like the men, but about how to be most useful at home and to support each other. This was, when you think about it, the original social network. A meeting was immediately called and on the evening of the 19th of February, Friday the 19th of February, 1897, 101 women and Mr Lee turned up in a storm at Squires Hall in Stony Creek and invented the Women's Institute. It took another 18 years for the WI to be exported here. Its missionary was an intriguing Canadian woman called Margaret Rose Robertson Watt, commonly known as Madge. I haven't time to talk about her now, but she was forceful, inspirational, entirely original, a bit like the WI really. Anglesey hosted the first ever WI meeting in Great Britain at Lanfair PG in September 1915. Here are the members outside their very first meeting place, which is an overgrown outbuilding in somebody's garden. They're all wearing their very best hats, though, and look proud to be there. The WI was unlike anything the women of Anglesey or anywhere else in the kingdom had come across before. Madge explained its significance to the first members. An institute is not ruled, she said, but rules itself. It was an important distinction to be made, since self-determination and democracy in practice were unfamiliar concepts to women in 1915. We didn't get the vote, remember, some of us, for another three years. A WI should cater for all tastes, said Madge. Explore the world together and learn as much about growing roses in your garden or trimming hats as about darkest Africa or Bolshevism. With canny prescience, she advised members to be adventurous in their approach to meetings. If you become dull, the young will not join, she said, and your numbers will decrease. Make sure you always include a social half hour in the programme. The chance for a chat reduces the amount of whispering during lectures. Have fun, but be fruitful, not frivolous. Men may laugh at the little woman, said Madge, but the time will come when that little woman, without tying herself to railings or knocking off policemen's hats, because this was the age of the suffragette, remember, will simply by making her views known throughout the Institute be able to demand and get healthful improvements in village life up and down the land. Use your power, ladies, to its full. And the concept that women had any power at that time was quite heady. Singleton in West Sussex and Wallace Down in Dorset each claimed to be the first WIs in England, started in the autumn of 1915. Madge naturally initiated them both. Lady Wimborne and her daughter Lady Chelmsford ran Wallace Down, but the Singleton pioneers seem to have prided themselves on a humbler foundation, holding their meetings in the back room of a local inn, the Fox at Charlton, where one of the founder members happened to be the landlady. This aroused much local suspicion. What kind of an outfit was this? to tempt wives and mothers away from home for secret sessions at the local pub. All sorts of wives, even spinsters, were turning up. 
One president brought her meeting to a semblance of order by clashing saucepan lids together. Another insisted on driving around the village with her chauffeur to scoop up members, both willing and less so, for her meetings. When a lady elsewhere fell foul of this newfangled democracy idea and was not, to her amazement, elected president of her WI, she's said to have nailed her front door shut in protest, thus making herself unequivocally unavailable to serve in any lowlier position on the committee. It was such a melting pot, this early WI. Gentle women were expected to function shoulder to shoulder with the working women or labourers' wives of the village, often for the very first time. It embraced academics and feminists, even firebrands like Edith Rigby, the founder of Lancashire's first WI. Edith had been a notorious public menace, a violent suffragette whose past offences included sprinkling acid on a golf course, setting fire to the industrialist Lord Leverhulme's bungalow and to the Blackburn Rovers football ground, and hurling first black puddings and then bombs, both commendably homemade, at Winston Churchill when he visited the Liverpool Cotton Exchange. She'd been imprisoned seven times, had been on hunger strike and force-fed, and yet she believed the WI to be utterly cutting edge, utterly wonderful. It's a pillar supporting the temple of national enlightenment, she said. It was the German submarine blockade of Britain, which began in February 1917, that first put fire in the belly of the WI. Before that, the role of the country housewife in wartime Britain was to be stoical, to endure, to do her best not to waste resources. This was noble work, but it was hardly a mission. Everything changed in October 1917, when the National Federation of Women's Institutes, or NFWI, was formed. Rumours were circulating that Britain had only three weeks' supply of food in reserve. That summer's harvest had been disastrous. Farms were empty of labour. German U-boats prevented the importation of what amounted to half the country's food. And there was a real risk of malnutrition, if not starvation. Old Blighty's heart was growing hollow. We have to prevent hunger, warned the government. Every ounce of food which can be grown in the country must be grown. And every woman who can give a hand in this vastly important work must give a hand. The newborn WI was immediately expected to take a lead in this, and it could only do so by working cooperatively. WIs around the country worked really hard to produce food for the non-commercial market. Rabbit clubs were a great favourite, breeding the creatures for their meat and their fur. There were pig clubs too, where the animals would be raised cooperatively and their meat shared out amongst the members. This had the added advantage of using up scraps, as did the rearing of poultry for meat, eggs and feathers. At Madron in Cornwall, girl guides were mustered to collect fresh kitchen waste in a barrel on wheels built and donated by the local carpenter. The pigs were killed by a WI husband, none of the members quite having the stomach to do it. They got to know the pig and then sold to the public rather than distributed amongst themselves just in case, and I quote, feeling ran so high that it might defeat the object of the Institute to bind women together. Skeynes Hill WI in Sussex was a very confident outfit. The rabbits in its rabbit club were proudly described in The Landswoman, which was the forerunner to the WI house magazine Home and Country, itself the forerunner to today's WI life. These rabbits were described as not just any old rabbits, but patriotic rabbits. Members ran a soft fruit cooperative where the fruit would be preserved in bottles or in cans with newfangled canners that could either be bought outright or hired at two shillings and sixpence a day. The collection of herbs and bark to be made into medicines and dyes fell easily to the WI. Parties of Institute members marched into the fields, perhaps singing a rather dire anthem called Daughters of Britain Work with a Will, currently being peddled as a national WI song, and they gathered sphagnum moss for dressing wounds, thistledown to fill quilts, dried ferns to stuff dolls, wisps of sheep's wool caught on hedges for spinning into yarn. This was the first age of national make-do and mend. 
There were WI classes, not just on tinkering, which you can see here, repairing saucepans and buckets and so on, or upholstery, basket making, but also cobbling, recommending old motorbike tyres for soling workmen's boots and more elegant bicycle tyres for ladies and children's shoes. The genesis of a lot of the crafts WI members enjoy today was in the necessities of the First World War. After the war, the help given to the country by the WI was gratefully acknowledged and following its baptism of fire, the Women's Institute movement quickly grew in numbers and public awareness. The list of resolutions put forward by WI members at AGMs during the first 10 years, say, of the NFWI's existence reveals an almost shocking liberality. In support of the Bastardy Bill, for example, whereby fathers were required to maintain their illegitimate children, this was in 1920, reflecting a wartime legacy of fatherless babies. Illegitimacy was not something ladies were supposed even to think about, let alone discuss, but members of the WI realised that it was a real problem after the First World War and it needed addressing. They campaigned for the better awareness and treatment of sexually transmitted diseases. This was 1922, following numbers of returning soldiers infecting their wives. This was an incredibly brave thing to campaign about, especially for a, a company of women who were hoping to be taken seriously and thought respectable. Um, for them to raise their heads above the moral parapet like this and campaign for not very nice subjects to be addressed was incredibly brave. They had a campaign for an increase in the number of women police officers in 1924. This was not just a question of equality, although that's important enough. It's because WI members realised that if women were suffering from sexual harassment or domestic abuse, they were far more likely to go to a woman police officer about it than they were to some burly great copper. There was a campaign for an investigation into maternal mortality in 1925. This is an incredible roster of activism, which is often forgotten when people think about the history of the WI, but it's been an activist movement from the very first moment. The WI's House magazine, I mentioned it a minute ago, Home and Country, publicised all these campaigns. It was a little like a WI meeting in print. Business matters came first, then educational pieces about history, art, local government, astronomy, so on. There were book and theatre reviews, tips on craft work, and most issues incorporated a knitting pattern. A charming long-sleeved jacket for the not-so-slim, for example. Or this nice but surely tickly underwear ensemble in Shetland wool. She's got a very far away look in her eyes, that model. There were competitions for limericks or full length essays, sections for members' children, a short story or serial, and a vigorous, vigorous letters page. Aspirational articles appeared on the achievements of women in politics, sciences or the arts, and occasional messages from government ministers reporting on WI campaigns or asking for members' help with surveys. Recipes were a regular, if not conspicuously successful feature. Rabbit brawn pops up with dreadful regularity. And there's the odd treat like Turkish Delight or Cocoa Flapjack, but nothing very imaginative. Perhaps the editor thought WI members were too conservative in the kitchen or too busy to try anything more adventurous than macaroni cheese with tomatoes on top or, as in a recipe I couldn't resist reprinting in the book, pineapple and brains. Home and country's advertisements ranged wildly between the quotidian and the exotic. Savile's soluble sanitary towels, very exotic in the 1930s, jostle with endless advertisements for birds custard. Homes of rest for women suffering, and I quote, from functional nervous disorders, alcoholism and drug addiction are next to ads for the latest high-heeled ostrich skin shoes. 
and the fantastically complicated Vestrol oil stove, which looks like a, the engine room of a small ship, is juxtaposed, ju juxtaposed, that's right, isn't it? Juxtaposed with an advertisement for black and white check knickers with an inside fleecy finish. Every month, top housekeeping tips are contributed by particularly thrifty or imaginative members, such as how to stuff your own mattress, that's fairly straightforward, how to make Dorothy bags out of men's top hats, very Joyce Grenfell, that one, and I had to ask what a Dorothy bag was when I read this, but apparently it's a little drawstring bag, so now you know what to do with all the gentlemen's top hats that are knocking around. How to make new bars of soap from the melted down relics of old ones. I remember that from my own Spartan childhood in North Yorkshire, except my mother used to mix them with something scratchy like um, silver sand or pumice to scour as clean. I thought everybody's soap was like sandpaper, but it's only since I've been given this talk that I realise um, that's not the case. The most beguiling bits are the photographs. Jaunty reports of Institute fancy dress competitions are accompanied by very stiff and solemn ladies, hands clasped tensely in front of them, wearing prize-winning headdresses, disguising them extremely imperfectly as, for instance, as you see in this photograph, a Toby jug on the left, a Christmas tree in the middle, and a birthday cake. In one photo, six of them stand side by side, looking as though they've crawled into striped paper sleeping bags head first and they've got neat little black shod feet peeping out the bottom and you're supposed to know immediately what they are. Anybody got any ideas? Five WI members in um, descending order, six actually, in descending order of height, white with black stripes. Well, they're a catch of mackerel, duh. This is where I wish I had more audio as well as visual. This is the Ali King's kazoo band dressed in almost matching hats, but perfectly matching grim expressions. While 11 mature members of the Herefordshire Federation pose perhaps improbably as a human pyramid in their vests and gym knickers. The one doing the splits at the bottom looks as though she's been there just a tad too long. An advertisement about the benefits of a tanning machine for babies is quite terrifying in retrospect, and it's accompanied by an evil-looking toddler wearing nothing but goggles and a demonic grin, and an advertisement for Mrs Clara E Slater's abdominal belt looks as though it's in entirely the wrong publication. There are photographs of children at WI first aid demonstrations bandaged to within an inch of their lives and for the magazine's younger readers a regular children's corner with stories and on one occasion a heartwarming picture with the caption two hedgehogs eating a dead rat. The WI was never a sentimental body. The Second World War is the period in the WI's history which, for good or ill, has defined it ever since. One of the most abiding images of the home front is of an apple-cheeked wife in her pinny, steadfastly filling jars from dawn till dusk with ambrosial preserves to feed the nation and spite the Nazis. The land is the mother of us all, said the Minister of Health, Walter Elliott, in 1939. The land is the mother of us all, but the members of the WI are the mothers of the land. They were custodians of England's heritage, the symbol of home values, and responsible armed with nothing more than wooden spoons and a cheerful stoicism for guarding the gates of civilization. Flattering as it is, I haven't yet met any member of the WI who isn't just a little bit sick of this catch-all Jam and Jerusalem label. There was so much more to the work of the WI during the war, not to mention all they did before and have done since. According to the government, they helped to tip the balance between victory and defeat. And you can't do that if your only weapons are a panful of plums and a song. 
The range of work done by WIs was even wider during the Second World War than it had been in the First. Dorset Federation compiled a record of their contribution to the home front, written in 1947 while memories were still fresh and pride ran understandably high. Unique vignettes of rural England at war emerge from its careful calligraphy and detailed illustrations and there's a strong sense of the spirit of the WI, whose members obviously felt very closely engaged with victory. This is a single page showing a produce market at the top, some evacuees and the memorable day, perhaps unique to Charmouth, when a cow was exploded by a landmine. If you look in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see the landmine. Follow up towards the top of the page and you'll see the cow. I mentioned evacuees just a moment ago. And some of the most important work done by WIs during the war was more social than practical. In December 1939, a questionnaire was sent to all the WI secretaries in the country to be filled in by any members who were looking after evacuated children and, in some cases, their mothers too. It wasn't a long questionnaire. It just asked how many children there were in the house, where they came from and whether they suffered from head lice, skin disease or bedwetting and other similarly insanitary habits. That's a quote. If the children's mothers were with them, WI members were asked if there were any, and again I quote, who lacked the knowledge or will to train their children in good habits. 1,700 institutes replied and their response, published in a WI book called Town Children Through Country Eyes, was shocking. Children were repeatedly described as filthy, sometimes verminous, so much so that evacuation reception areas had to be fumigated after they left. Of 849 children who arrived at Dorchester WI in Dorset, 229 had lice, 19 had fairly advanced skin diseases and 43 habitually wet the bed. Although the fact that they wet the bed when they arrived in Dorset as evacuees doesn't mean that they did at home. It must have been absolutely terrifying for them. One distraught WI member reported a family from Bethnal Green climbing on to the bed to urinate and defecate. Another had to cut her charges free of the ragged clothes into which they had been stitched who knows how long ago. The news wasn't all bad. Occasionally WI members would report what they called a nice class of child and talk about the pleasure of having war visitors around rather than evacuees. And things could get better very quickly. Two children in Norfolk put on half a stone in one week and mothers were learning to cook and sew for the first time in their lives. It was a joy to watch children visibly growing healthy and happy in the countryside. But overall, the picture presented by the WI questionnaire was a pretty grim one and revealed the state of Britain's urban slums, ironically for a rural organisation, with uncompromising clarity. William Beveridge, commissioned by the government to write a report into social reconstruction after the war, took careful note. His report recommended economic and educational reforms, including child allowances and state education from the ages of 2 to 16, and acknowledged its debt to the WI, whose members were arguably the first to open Britain's eyes to the desperate need for a national welfare state. And that is something that WI members should be hugely proud of in their heritage. Back to practicalities. In 1948, the NFWI sprang into action again, this time with Operation Produce. The premise was simple. Every single WI member in the land, and there were over 379,000 of them then, should be encouraged to produce an extra £10, 5 kilos, of food during the coming year. Institutes with participating members were to keep logbooks of their efforts, organised to display the unique achievements of each institute. 85,000 members responded and 404 logbooks were submitted to county federations at the end of the year to be judged and admired. 
none can have been more impressive than Backton and districts in Institute in East Suffolk with 61 members. There, the Institute secretary and Mrs Muscroft considered record keeping a work of art, as you can see. In the true spirit of the WI, Backton and District's beautiful book also reveals a great deal of hard, constructive work, tempered with good humour and a sense of celebration. It opens in March when each member was given six little seed potatoes to plant. There was a competition. Come on, this is a WI. There was a competition to see who could coax the highest yield from the Suffolk soil. And I should say at this point that Mrs Muscroft, the WI secretary, was not only an artist but a poet. And this is how she describes the competition. To mention some may seem invidious, but the digging fever was insidious. Most of them dug and we encore them. The rest got their husbands to do it for them. Meanwhile, another competition opened, this one for the best ode to a potato. The prize of gladioli bulbs went to a rhapsodic composition by a modestly anonymous poet. I think I'll give you just one verse of her ode to a potato. Lovers may dream of eyes of blue, but I dream only spud of you, whose eyes aren't limited to two. Sweet eyes of brown, which match your gown, and are so full of promise too. And it goes on and on and on in this love song to a potato. To reach their target of £10 of food each, most members diversify, di diversified from potatoes. This is the WI compost heap, by the way, fuming away in the background. There are pages in the log book, each with utterly beguiling illustrations, about a dedicated band of tomato growers, people keeping bees, cabbages, carrots and salad vegetables were all successful as long as the soil was friable enough. If not, there was a worm subcommittee to whom you could apply. There are pages of egg activities about parent chickens, geese, ducks and turkeys. The rabbit recreation page reports an astonishing amount of rabbit recreation. While my favourite page deals with news from the styes, in which it's noted that Mrs T. Goodrum is attempting to fatten a pig, but it has grown not only in girth, but also in charm and has become a pet. And there's a sketch of said pig, very portly, sitting on Mrs Goodrum's lap in an armchair in front of the fire. Three members of the Institute bought a portable canning machine between them. It's still there in the village in the secretary's garage, just in case. And they continued the soft fruit preservation at which they'd become so expert during the war. Others made dandelion or cowslip wine and further afield people bottled walnuts and almonds, pickles... It's a bit like that wonderful poem, Adel's Trop, where the train stops at a station and the poet hears one bird singing and then imagines all the birds singing in the shires beyond. And that's how I think about Operation Produce, really. This is one village in focus. But all the villages, when everybody was exhausted after the war, they're all stepping up to the plate and doing their best to produce food for local communities and for the wider country. It's something to be hugely proud of for the WI. In August, the results of the Spud competition were announced. They were staggering. The winner, Mrs Manning, managed to produce 59 pounds of potatoes from her original six little tubers. The average yield was 30 pounds and from the two pounds of seed potatoes shared amongst them in March, they conjured up a total of 1,414 pounds of potatoes. That took Backton and District WI way beyond the £10 target, without counting all the other stuff they grew or nurtured between them. Following a diary of every member's operation produce activities signed by the women themselves, Mrs Muscroft closed the logbook with a short apologia for her own absence in the roster of producers. After reading this book, gentle judge, you may think it was a sheer waste of energy, even of ink, how much better employed the compiler might be in coercing a cabbage or coaxing a bee? In this, oh my critic, I beg of your pardon, for I am a menace in anyone's garden, much worse than green fly or the pestilent slug. So it's best to have written 
and not to have dug. Backton and District's logbook was submitted as required to the county authorities at the end of 1948, no doubt with a good deal of confidence. The best from around the country were due to be sent to the United States to thank the American people for supplying so many seeds to the WI during the war. Surely Backton's would be hard to beat. Well, Mrs Muscroft reckoned without the adamantine seam of bureaucratic pedantry running through the edifice of the NFWI at the time. Backton and District had been a little too free in its record-keeping, a little too unnecessary in its presentation. A terse note came back with the logbook. Book used not according to schedule, but otherwise excellent. We should be grateful it was never sent to America. It's a treasure. I know of two Operation Produce logbooks in this country. There must be more. If you are WI members listening to this, especially if you are WI archivists, look under your beds, look in the garage, look wherever you can and see if you can find another Operation Produce logbook for your WI. Because they're not only important documents in the history of the Women's Institute, they're important documents for us all because they tell us so much about what was going on in the period immediately after the Second World War, which is often ignored by historians. The adventures of the Calendar Girls and the Tony Blair episode invigorated the WI. It had been flagging a bit in the decades after the Second World War. Perhaps this illustration from Home and Country published in 1967 might help explain why. It'll also ring bells with any of you who have any committee experience at all. I'll just point you to two or three of my favourites of a dozen ways to kill an institute. Number three, never accept office as it's easier to grouse than to do things. Number four, nevertheless get cross if you are not elected to the committee, but if you are, do not attend committee meetings. Number five, if asked by the president to give your opinion on some important matter, tell her you've got nothing to say. Number six, after the meeting, tell everyone how things ought to be done. I think my favourite is uh, number 11, chain smoke and bring your knitting. Thanks to its soaring profile, opinion about the WI was highly polarised at the beginning of the 21st century. You probably don't need me to tell you that. It was variously labelled a trade union for housewives. That's fair enough. A reactionary outfit intent on destabilising the government. A sort of monstrous regiment of blue rinsed women. A band of frustrated attention seekers rather pathetically offering themselves up for sexual exploitation. A cantankerous, humourless, colourless mob of old hags. That's a quote from Home and Country, a depressing anachronism, they've been called, and the last refuge of the British frump. Every new article or feature about the WI unerringly relied for impact on the contrast between the stereotype in her twin set and her pearls and the surprisingly radical things she seemed to be doing. It got a bit wearing and distracted from the real story. Because despite all the innovations of the past decades, at the core of every WI in the country is still the spirit of cooperation and mutual support with a good cup of tea that drove the movement forward in its earliest days. Time and time again, when I asked modern members what is the most important thing about their WI, they say friendship. They joined as newcomers to the village, or nowadays the town, the city, the professional workplace, the mental hospital, the, the army base, you name it, the university. There's probably going to be a WI there because a kind neighbour or friend took them along to a meeting to make new friends. There they would find sympathetic, if not necessarily like-minded, women of all ages and backgrounds with whom they could relax and be not mothers, nor wives, nor anything they wanted to be apart from themselves. A friendly, safe, non-judgmental atmosphere gave them the confidence to trust their own judgment, keep an open mind and stand up to be counted on issues they believed in. Courage is a gift of friendship too. 
and nothing's changed about that since the day the British WI was founded over a hundred years ago. Goodbye.